As uh, you might all know, everybody is wondering if Donald Trump would run again for president at 2024. There's a lot of strong indications and a lot of signs where even both parties are seeing it and they're preparing for that day. Uh, what this relates to the church age might be something that's more historical and prophetic than you think, believe it or not. Uh, this event and rumors about Trump, uh, who's, who might run for 2024, is a pattern that we see in history and even prophetically. And there are some scripture verses that can show something enlightening to that. Now, first of all is this. I want to make it very clear that uh, honor to whom honor is due. So, yeah, I thank God for the good things that Trump has done. But it, is, it must be clarified that I do not put my faith in him as a savior or anything like that. If you look at his life, uh, there's a lot of corruption in his life as well. That might be taboo to some people, but no, let's just be honest. Honest is honest. Uh, there are some corruptions and corrupted things in his life. However, I do have to admit, unlike all the other presidents, pretty much all the other presidents before him, this is the guy that uh, made the most strides and then resisted much of uh, the evil to bring a lot that contributed to our Christian community. However, he has a lot of corrupted things, and there might be a surprise. There might be a surprise, something more ominous, something more villainous with what Trump's doing. So it may not be as good or as innocent as you think. So we have yet to see. That's why it's so important not to put your faith or obsession into politics, into all the current events or everything what's going on. People talk about prophecy, prophecy, and then they get involved in current events. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to cover that stuff too, but there's a difference with obsession into those things and then just an awareness of those things. People who usually get obsessed in, these kinds of, in this kind of stuff, they are the people who tend to not know many verses in their Bible and probably don't attend a Bible-believing church. So let that be food for thought. But anyway, a church is not a news media showroom. Do you understand that? A church is not a news media showroom. A church is where you teach the Bible. So undoubtedly, because there are some current events and political issues that relate to the Bible, then that's why I would be explaining those things. However, when I concentrate so much on the current events and then politics and other stuff, then what happens, it, it deviates from the Bible. So I don't do it that way. I don't do it that way. Anyways, how I could see it relate to the Bible, where the church is going to have a preparation and an awareness of what's going on and what's going to come to pass. But first, let's cover the rumors about Trump. There's a, there's a shift. There's a change. We can see that. Uh, the last couple of months we've seen where the current president has taken things over, and then there has been a retaliation from the Republican Party side. So then they've made an amazing wave and compact where uh, the Democrats and even CNN, as I mentioned to you before from documented sources, that they could strongly win the elections because there's a huge wave coming out because of resistance and anger. However, Roe v. Wade, that kind of victory for the Republican side, has also bit back on them. It, uh, it caused the angst and then the retaliation on the Democrat side as well. Now, if there's one thing you notice is this. I don't know if you notice this. In our pattern here of our society, it swings the pendulum. Okay, it starts out with one party where they get a victory, then the other side gets very angry. So then they win the victory, but it just swung the pendulum extremely more to the other side. Then the other side gets more angry, and then they get the victory, and it swings it around. Then pretty soon, it's just going to hit around the clock tower and then just kaputs. Everything falls apart. That's what we're seeing. It started with the Obama era where the right-wingers, they got so upset and that's the reason why the unpredictable happened, the unexpected happened, where Trump won. Then it just swung it so much where our society just came to the point where it is today, where there were peaceful, violent riots. Is that the right word to use it? Okay, because they like to call it peaceful, so let's just call it that. 
There were peaceful, violent riots and bloodshed on the streets in a peaceful way, of course. And uh, everybody just getting upset with uh, the rules and uh, government telling them what to do, uh, preventing certain rights and freedom and privileges and putting something in you that people don't want to put something in them. Okay, you can guess. Okay, but anyways, that's the kind of society that we live in. It swung the pendulum, uh, the pendulum to the extreme that what's next, right? So what people thought the Republican Party could likely win on the next elections, now there's some doubt. Now, that because the Democrats started to rise up out of anger. So that's the time that we're living in. But we see uh, the evildoers where they've been kicked out, stepped out, and then the Republicans are making a comeback and a wave, but now the Democrats are fighting back. So catching up the times, let's see how this is going. First of all, we know that CNN, they've been hitting it really bad. I mean, their CEO, Jeff Zuckerberg, went downhill. Cuomo got caught, rightfully so. And then uh, Brian Stelter, oh, poor guy, the guy who has that funny voice. So he got kicked out too. I mean, they just don't, uh, CNN has been, been, has been hit pretty hard because a whole bunch of uh, right-wingers or whatever their influence is causing is just axing the left-wing media. Uh, this is a title from Slate. A reliable source of concern why Brian Stelter's axing is a very bad omen for CNN. <laughs> they've just been hitting hard their CNN Plus that they've been raving about. I think lasted a couple weeks or something like that. And then they just lost the program. And then Fauci, you know, he, he got stepped down from the New York Times. Title of the article, Fauci says he will step down in December to pursue his next chapter. Ooh, I wonder what that will be, right? Then you get so many people going to social media, even if the mainstream social media has kicked them out, they start their own platforms. So then now Google is going through some kind of process where they're fighting with Trump because they don't want his, I think he called it truth platform or something like that. Uh, they were trying to prevent that from ever coming or popping out in Google. But uh, there's just so much resistance on both sides now. Now they're fighting really hard, fighting really hard. People thought that Roe v. Wade was a huge victory and that would uh, be the end. But you, I knew once they won that it would start a huge swing from the left after that. It's just causing a greater tension and greater rise. Uh, for, for Trump... It seems like he's been very busy, which is not a surprise. He said he would. And he's been hard at work where he can uh, talk to officials and politicians and those in power where he can ha still have a large influence and maybe, maybe run for 2024 presidency. Sky News mentioned in their article, Donald Trump hints he may run for 2024 presidency, saying, I may just have to do it again. Another one from CNBC, a left-wing source, even admits, titled, Trump 2024 could be one of the greatest political comebacks in American history, says Sen Senator uh, Lindsey Graham. There's a website, believe it or not, called Trump2024.film. And this has been uh, promoted by all the big right-wing news media networks that you heard about. Uh, Newsmax, uh, Mike Gallagher Show, uh, Dennis Prager Show, 700 Club got involved, and then obviously OAN, One America News Network, and a lot of other uh, big shows, conservative media networks, have been heavily involved in this, and they produce their own documentary on Trump 2024, literally. <laughs> That's the title of the documentary. You've seen so many other documentaries that have been flooding out. Epoch Times have been having a field day with finding a lot of uh, issues with the, mm -hmm. and then they've just been pouring article, article after that. They've been pouring article after article about elections that there were issues with that, they claimed. I'll just say it that way, okay? But 
because there's so, uh, so many documentaries, so many people studying, and so many people resisting the current left-wing government setup, now the left-wingers, they're starting their fight as well. And it, it's gotten so much to the point where the federal agents even got involved, and you heard about that uh, infamous raid that happened in one of uh, Trump's homes, and then the news media has been having a field day trying to claim that Trump, uh, he was dabbling with documents that, why would he have these documents that were questionable, that talked about nuclear capabilities, that were foreign documents. So there were a bunch of people claiming, including Ben Shapiro, that this would be a big, uh, that this would be a big bruise and an issue to Trump. So title from the New York Post is Ben Shapiro, GOP, Cruising for a bruising by sticking with Trump. Prominent right-wing media personality Ben Shapiro called on the Republican Party to ditch former President Donald Trump to boost its chances of winning elections. So you can see that whoever, the, those in power behind the scenes, when you get federal, when you get FBI involved in something like that, in a president's home, for crying out loud, you know you're shaking the system. And what's going to happen is, it's not going to be little guys versus little guys. No, we've already hit, collided that so much. It's going to be big guys with big guys, and what's going to happen next? It's going to come to a point where you know how you get a savior? You know how you get people longing and looking for a savior? I'll tell you how, when you have war. Yeah. I'll tell you when there's violence so bad. I'll tell you how, when peace can't be brought to the table, and you want somebody that can just bring the peace and then just get the war over with. If you don't study history, look at history. You know how you vote a person in to be a globalist, a huge one world leader? When you're longing for a savior. But see, we're still too independent in our mindset. America's uh, foundation is built upon that, that independence. So what they're trying to do is trying to break that more and more. And when you break it more and more, people are going to be sick and tired of fighting. And if you study history, that's how United Nations came to the scene. It's when you get greater violence, greater war, greater instability, that you don't care anymore and you long for a savior and a leader. If you don't believe it, how did, uh, look at Trump when he became president. There's so many different churches and people just uniting together without any issue. And by the way, Trump is the one that boosted Operation Warp Speed. Yeah. This one. It's not the current president, it's him. But a lot of people are able to overlook that. Why? Because of the anger against the other side. And we want somebody, some hero out there, and he's got the power to do it. That's why people are willing to overlook differences in issues and unite together. Look at the left-wing side, all right? Why are they willing to vote for... Oh, no one's there to shake hands with. Why are they willing to do that? They don't care. You know why? Because they're upset with the other side. So they're, able, so they're willing to overlook any differences or issues with that. Yeah. That's the kind of generation and people that we live in today. That's why they're willing. See, you got to realize this. When the Antichrist gets voted as one world leader, there's no issues if people and everybody is sick and tired and angry. Yeah. And they want some hero, some savior that will just rescue them from the problem. Sure. That's something to think about. It's pretty funny. Is uh, here's the title uh, of the article from uh, from one source, Outkick. CNN changes Joe Biden's blood red backdrop to warmer pink mid speech. Now I don't know if you uh, if you know what I'm talking about, but uh, the current president he did a speech where he was really slamming against MAGA, and he was trying to uh, his speech strongly indicated a difference with MAGA extremists, he called it, versus the Republicans. So he's trying to get the Republicans on his side. But while he was giving this speech, it looked like a Hitler scenery. And then if you look at the backdrop, every, it was like red and black. 
So red lights coming from the bottom and top while it was dark behind it and soldiers, dressed up soldiers behind him. So there were uh, people, I think it was Taylor, that was one of them that couldn't resist and took that, uh, took that video footage and they did some additions by drawing a mustache on Biden like this and then making it look a little bit Nazi-like, the scenery. But uh, people couldn't resist that. And actually, according to this person, when he was watching the video, is that because the red backdrop just looked really <laughs> ominous, it looked like a Nazi Hitler thing. Now, I don't know if you saw Jill Biden, I think it was last year, but there was a flag behind her with a bird like this. And that bird, if you've seen a lot of Nazi symbols, it looked like uh, the Nazi Reich, the bird behind her. So she got critiqued for that one. I don't know why Nazi imagery always follows the Bidens for some weird reason when they're complaining that, uh, that Trump is the one who is the, you know, ultimate Nazi, right? So it's just kind of funny. But anyway, both sides just criticizing each other for being a Nazi. And it's just funny how CNN changed it to war warmer pink, you know. To make it a little bit more of a friendly feeling. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look it up yourself and then you will see it does look pretty Hitler-esque. It, lo it really looks Nazi-like. It's pretty ominous, the scenery. He's going like this and then it's red behind him. <laughs> it just looks pretty, pretty scary. Anyways... What I'm seeing right here, like I told you, and I've given you all these sources of what's going on. So it seems like that the evildoers, so to speak, and throughout history there has always been people who played the evil side. There were people who played the evil side, and if you study throughout history, there have been God's people... And there were Jews in the Old Testament and the Christian church in the New Testament. But God's people and the saints, they've always went through the times of the Gentiles, we call this. All of this is called times of the Gentiles. And during the time of the Gentiles, we are under the kingdoms of this world. Under the kingdoms of this world, saints have always suffered at the hands of evildoers and kings that God doesn't really give a care for. Now, I know that might shock some of you, but God really doesn't care about Donald Trump. God doesn't care about current rulers of today. And I'm going to show you verses on that one. However, there have been times that God has used these rulers and kings that God don't care about for his glory and for his purpose. And they have done good means that have benefited the saints and God's people. And that is a historical fact and a pattern that you see. There have been evildoers within kingdoms and governments throughout past history, but then the Lord can use current rulers that he don't care for to sometimes to sometimes turn the tide against the evildoers so that, why? So that God's children and his people can keep serving him freely as much as they should, can keep preaching the gospel as freely as much as they should. The reason why we don't have a total communism system yet is because the hand and the mercy of God, where he is still giving some privileges and freedom behind the scene for us, to keep preaching the gospel while we can. Great evidence was uh, last year, right? Last year, we could street preach freely. You know why we were able to street preach freely? Because of, uh, because of evildoers, because of left-wingers who God used for his glory. All that public protest and everything, let us have our freedom of right for free speech. Well, why not us street preachers then? I mean, we got a lot of fire from the news media for that before, yeah. before BLM came out. You know that? But ever since BLM came out, not a peep about street preachers. Yeah. Not a peep about street preachers. So the Lord has used the wrath of man for his glory and for his praise. Amen. And that's what we see as a historical pattern. So God can use 
current rulers in our government for his glory to provide certain privileges and freedom for his people. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look in all these cases right here. The first one we're going to look at is Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Now look at the wording right here. Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, you have to understand, he was a ruthless dictator and, and king. He was a nightmare. He was considered to be the basest of men. And God sets up the basest of men to be his ruler. You know that? That's hard to believe. People think that there's a God-appointed ruler that will bring deliverance. And then there are other rulers who are just demonic so that we have to have resistance. That's why Christians are so balanced. Bible-believing Bible -believing Christians are so balanced. We're not anarchists. We're not anarchists. But neither are we so much patriots either. You might say, why is that? Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in uh, serving my country, loving my country. But I am not as patriotic as you think. You might say, why is that? Because there are corrupted leaders within our system. And I'm not an anarchist either because I already recognize there's corrupted leaders within our system. And God says we are supposed to submit to the authority even if they're corrupted. The only time we draw the line is because when they tell us to contradict Scripture, that's when we say no. But all the other parts, we're submitted, and uh, we, don't ha we don't raise an anarchy about it. But neither are we worshipers of certain leaders either and adore them. If you, because why? Our faith is not in men. Our faith is in the Lord and in His Word. That's how we always live. That's how Christianity and even the Old Testament saints have survived through every government. Every government throughout the ages. Look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. Oh, look at that. So God lets the men rule for him and giveth it to whomsoever he will, even to who, and setteth up over it the who? Basest of men. He sets it up. Sure, people might cry about uh, election fraud, and I can emphasize with that one, but the thing is this, I believe that it was the Lord. It's not, oh, it's the evildoers behind the scene. No, it's who allowed it to happen? It's the Lord. You might say, why would God do that? Because everything's according to his plan. He's setting things up for the tribulation for the Antichrist to come. He's basically giving America, I know you don't want to hear this, he's giving America what they deserve. You deserved to be your ruler. You know why? You're like this with the word of God. How many people have I offended just now? Yeah, you deserve a ruler like that because you treat that way with the word of God. And before some of you people who claim to be Christians get upset at me, I wonder if you can quote me one Bible verse from memory. You have a memory problem like this guy, don't you? All right. Altar call, you know. But notice right here that he sets up the basis of men. That's God. God appoints everybody. God appoints everybody, Trump, Biden, Obama, whoever. He sets it up for a purpose. Why? Because he doesn't consider much about those kingdoms. They're based to him. Even Nebuchadnezzar realized that himself. Nebuchadnezzar said, if you look at uh, Daniel chapter 4, and then notice at verse, let's see here, 35, 35. Nebuchadnezzar himself admitted and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as what? Nothing. Nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what, do, what dost thou? Nebuchadnezzar is such a corrupted leader, but he became a saved person at Daniel 4. He recognized the God of Israel. But even he himself, who got saved, Oh, Trump's a Christian, Trump's a Christian. Well, 
even Nebuchadnezzar, who got a, became a Christian, so to speak, he even realized, I'm nothing. Yeah. Everything here is nothing in the eyes of the Lord. How about that, huh? How about that? Why? Because this is not God's kingdom. You treat America like God's kingdom. No, this is not God's kingdom. God's kingdom has been done a long time ago. It was with the nation of Israel, but he postponed it. Now he turned his kingdom into a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. And that spiritual kingdom is right here, the church. So the church in our fellowship, in our growth with the Lord Jesus Christ, his physical kingdom is going to come down after the Antichrist kingdom here in the tribulation. After the Antichrist, the world has their one world government, their one world kingdom. God's going to prove to them that at their best, it falls apart. And then he comes down at the end and sets up his physical kingdom to set mankind straight. If you are a kingdom builder and uh, you believe that you have to build up the kingdom yourself, and that's what churches are doing all over with their lavish buildings and everything, getting involved heavily into politics and everything. My friend, uh, your efforts are so vain and little compared to what God can do. God, all he has to do is step down one time and set things right. You, on the other hand, if you think you can help God out by bringing in his kingdom, you don't know your Bible and you don't know God. You don't know the Lord. The Lord will bring it himself. There's too much prophecy. Didn't you know three quarters of your Bible is pretty much the second advent? Yeah. It's God coming down, sending up his kingdom. Pretty much three quarters of your Bible. Look at the major prophets, minor prophets, which make the huge bulk of your scripture. Psalm, which make a huge bulk of your scripture. So much of that is second advent about the king and his righteousness ruling. We see Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked king like him, how the Lord was able to use him to help out the saints. Look at Daniel 3, Daniel chapter 3. What did he say in Daniel chapter 3, in verse 29? Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Wow, so notice right here, God can use a corrupted king to actually benefit the saints where he had the whole nation basically worship God. Wow, that's really huge. Not even Trump could do that. But what did God consider his government? Nothing. Trump can turn everybody into Christians and it'll become a Christian nation again. Sure, do that, but you know what God considers a nation? Nothing. How about that? Uh, here's another one. Go to, uh, Jer uh, go to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. Why does God consider the nation as nothing? The reason why is because that's not his nation. That's not his kingdom. It's going to come at the millennium in the future. He'll set it up one day. Look at Isaiah chapter 44. Verse 28, second ruler, Persia, Cyrus. God has done the same thing with Cyrus. And as a matter of fact, God calls Cyrus his anointed. God calls Cyrus his anointed. Notice that Cyrus has benefited God's people and even restored their temple. The Jews had evildoers resisting their temple in the book of Nehemiah. But you know, God protected them through rulers. And he used Cyrus, his anointed. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Wow, God calls Cyrus his shepherd. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Look at 45, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Wow, God calls Cyrus his anointed, his shepherd. 
And what did he call him to do? In verse 28, chapter 44, verse 28, it was to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. As a matter of fact, when Trump uh, considered Jerusalem to be the capital of the nation of Israel, you know what the Jews did? They struck a coin for Donald Trump and put his image as Cyrus. Wow. So what did God do? Just like God used Cyrus, his anointed, to help out the Jews, he could do the same thing with Donald Trump during the church age. Why? Because there's a history and a pattern, and I will show you New Testament verses God can do this. There's a pattern that God can use rulers that he consider as nothing, rulers who can even be corrupt for his glory, for his purpose, that can even help out and give some privilege and freedom to his people. Amen. We see that case after case historically and scripturally. So Cyrus must be a great guy. Persia is a godly kingdom. No, look at Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. God don't think so. God don't think so. Look at Daniel chapter 10 verse 13. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13. God considers Persia, like other Gentile kingdoms, as nothing and even satanic. <laughs> satanic, you know that? Why? Because who's the God of this world? Who's in charge of these current kingdoms? Who's in charge of America's kingdom? Don't say God. You know who's in charge right now. It's Satan, the God of this world. America is no exception. You can put in God we trust, great, but did you look at the back of that coin? Don't deny satanic symbolism is not in there at the back of your dollar bill. In God we trust. Look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. <laughs> Look at right here. So notice that whoever this prince of Persia is was fighting against the angelic being, and even Michael the archangel had to step in. Why, that ain't an earthly human Persian king. That's the spiritual, that's a spiritual prince of Persia. That's the spirit behind the princes of Persia, the kings of Persia today. See, it's the devil. It's the devil. Okay, so we see that with Cyrus, with Persia. Does God do it again with Greece? Yes, he does it again with Greece on how he was able to, on how God used a ruler that could be demonic, part of Satan's kingdom, or considered as nothing to God, and yet be used for his glory and can benefit his own people. Okay, is Greece considered to be a good guy? Well, look at Daniel 10 again. And then notice right here in Daniel chapter 10, and then God says, at verse 20, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. What you're going to see is connected again to satanic forces. Go to Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. As a matter of fact, the spirit behind the king of Grecia is connected to the Antichrist, God will show. The Antichrist. Like a Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Okay? But look what's following the kingship of Grecia. Look at verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom... When the transgressors are come to the full. So that's not something good. It's transgression God sees as. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's the Antichrist. Look at the wording here. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Oh, he turns against God's people. That's the Antichrist. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, 
and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the, that's God, prince of princes. That's definitely the Antichrist then. He's resisting and he's trying to conquer God. So notice that the kingly line of Greece is connected to satanic forces. But did they benefit God's people? They sure did, actually. I don't know if you knew this in your history. Josephus is a first century uh, Jewish historian. And I'm not going to claim this as a historical fact, but in order to make sure that your knowledge increases with history, you have to look at all possibilities, right? You can't just ignore sources. No, you have to look at all the sources and be open-minded. So here is one how Josephus wrote about it. This is interesting. This is Jadua. Jadua was actually the high priest during this timeline, the high priest of Israel. So the high priest of Israel during this time, he actually, and the claim is, the Lord spoke to them in a vision or in a dream and including Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was in fear and then he claimed, and Jadua also claimed, that the Lord was the one who brought up the meeting with him and Alexander, with the high priest and Alexander, and that Alexander would actually help out the Jewish people. Didn't you know that? So Josephus mentioned that record. I will read it to you. So his name is supposed to be Jadua. Let me write his name here. And he supposedly had a meeting with Alexander the Great. As a matter of fact, there are pictures. You can look at paintings. If you don't believe me, you can simply do a Google search yourself, and then you'll see paintings real easily. Uh, of uh, Just type down Jadua, Alexander the Great, and there are paintings and portraits of people knowing this, uh, this incident that occurred where Alexander the Great actually did some kind of respect or reverence to the Jewish people and even to the high priest itself. I saw this very person in a dream. This is how Jadua actually explained. Uh, this is Alexander, how he explained it. I saw this very person in a dream in this very habit when I was at Dios in Macedonia, who when I was considering with myself how I might obtain dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly pa to pass over the sea, promising that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. Alexander then gave the high priest his right hand and went into the temple and offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction, treating the whole priesthood magnificently. So Alexander the Great claimed that he received this dream that this high priest would basically tell him that he would conquer the Persians and that his kingdom would be grown magnificently. And as a matter of fact, that's what happened. Jadua mentioned about the book of Daniel. This passage you're reading, Daniel 8, and that there was a prophecy that Alexander the Great is that goat where he would uh, thrust the Persians, which is represented as a ram in Daniel chapter 8. And you can read that in your spare time. Quote, uh, Jadua, uh, so Jadua, he took out a Hebrew scroll, scroll from the Tanakh and mentioned this. When the book of Daniel was shown him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that he was the person intended and rejoiced thereat. The following day, Alexander asked the people what favors he should grant them and at the high priest's request, he accorded them the right to live in full enjoyment of the laws of their forefathers. How about that? So notice how God even used Alexander the Great. And if you look at his accounts, he sounded like a drunken madman or demon-possessed person. Like if people shot out arrows at him, he just didn't care and just went through it like a madman. And the Bible told you that the Antichrist spirit is behind the Grecian Empire. 
Yet notice right here that God can even use a, a wicked ruler where he actually benefits the people of God. How about that? Even, even Rome. Even Rome. And you know who's the ruler? Nero. Oh, and by the way, it's even bolder than that. Paul mentioned that Nero as the ruler, that he is the unofficial version of the Antichrist. Paul mentioned that. But look what Paul said. <laughs> look at Acts. Uh, if you don't believe me, first of all, let's do one by one, all right? Let's first go to Acts 28. Acts 28. Acts chapter 28. I'll mention about the unofficial version of the Antichrist later, but I want you to go to Acts 28. Now remember, Nero was the one who started the persecution of Christians, right? If you want to see like Satan incarnate, he would be the one. But notice that even an evil guy like him who's persecuting Christians, God was able to use him to benefit his people. Look at Acts chapter 28 if you don't believe me. Acts chapter 28. Notice what the Bible says in verse uh, 19. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. Now notice what Paul said. Paul, he appealed, he resorted to Caesar for help against his enemies. His own people, the Jews, they wanted to kill him. But Paul appealed and looked to Caesar as his savior or hero at this moment. That's why he mentioned about his rights of a Roman citizen. It was his protection. How about that? And notice right here in verse 31 preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Notice that Caesar protected Paul under house arrest and made sure he had freedom to preach even at his own people. Protection from a guy who was persecuting Christians, isn't that funny? Hey, even more wilder than that, there were people in Caesar's own household saved by Paul. Look at Philippians, Philippians 4, Philippians 4. Man, what freedom, what privilege. See, God can use anyone. God can use anyone. And that's the same thing you're seeing right now with Trump and any other ruler that would happen. People are looking for Trump as a savior and as a hero and something like that. And in some cases, Trump did, Trump did. But to rely on him as the ultimate savior and redeemer and the Messiah and something like that? No, no, no. God considers them as nothing. Amen. What does God do? God just uses them as pawn pieces for his glory. And that's the savior you got to be looking at. It's, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Notice in verse 22. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of what? Caesar's household. Wow, when Nero was emperor that time. And Paul had such freedom to give the gospel and protection from Jews at the same time. He got, basically, the FBI protecting him. He's got uh, the capital city, the actual guards of Nero's, soldier, uh, Nero's own empire protecting him. Man, that's a lot of protection. Nero must be a good guy. No, he is. He's the one that persecuted Christians. He's the one that persecuted Christians. Now, let me show you this historical pattern did not change. It continued on in the church age. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2. Do you know why we, the Bible says we are to pray for our leaders? Our government leaders, well, they're so corrupt, they're so wicked. Yeah, but I think Paul realized the benefit of that prayer. Nero is evil, but let's pray for him. Why? So that I can have freedom to preach the gospel. So I can have protection from the evildoers. God can do that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
That's the reason why God can raise up certain heroes, so to speak, or saviors or rulers who can give protection or freedom at a temporary moment. Why? It's because of the gospel's sake. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in, that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. See that? It's so that we can maintain still some remnant of peace, some amount of peace to keep preaching the gospel. Okay, let's look at 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. Look at this one. Nero, remember, was ruler at this time. He was ruler at Peter's timeline as well. But look what Peter said. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 13, 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So look at that. Even when Nero was in charge that time, Peter recognized that God can still, within that government system, there can be some leaders who can at least do some benefit or some sort of good for God's people. Verse 15, For so is the will of God that with well-doing he may put to silence the, ignorant of the ignorance of foolish men as free. See that? And not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. That's important. That's why we're not anarchists. See that? We're not anarchists. Why? Because we pray for the leaders. I don't care if it's a good guy, bad guy. What God sees them all is as nothing in his eyes. And the kingdoms of this earth are corrupt in God's eyes. It's ruled by the forces of Satan himself. What we need to do is just simply pray and submit to the rulers, except when it crosses the line with the Bible, then we stand up for persecution. But there's no anarchy right here. Why? Because Peter says so that we can put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, when they say Christians are terrorists and fanatics and they're the one that's uh, causing trouble to this country, oh, we want to put to silence to their false accusations. We want to put to silence their ignorant accusations. Notice verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. How about that? How about that? Notice this perfect balance where we're not overtly adoring the kings and at the same time we're not anarchists either. That's what a balanced Christian should be. What are Christian churches going through right now? What is the world going through right now? It's all chaos in one side of the extreme or the other. It's just so messed up. They're either overtly patriotic and adoring the rulership or they're total anarchists. Why are they doing? They haven't been paying attention to scriptures. They've been paying attention more to politics, haven't they? See that? As you study politics more and more and more, it just makes you angry. But as you study the Bible, it shows you how to treat such political issues. Where have you been? You haven't been reading much of your Bible. So notice right here that, yes, the rulers, they can provide protection against evildoers. Isn't that what uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 pointed out? They can provide certain amount of privilege and freedom and protection from evildoers. Yes, even in the church age. That's what's going on right now. That's what's going on right now. That's why God raised up Trump and then he switched it to Biden and etc. Why is that? Because God, whenever good opportunity we had and whatever ruler gave some kind of benefit or privilege or opportunity or freedom to us Christians, it's what God has always done at the previous eras of the church age and in Rome, Greece, Persia, and Babylon with his nation of Israel. That's what I'm seeing with Trump 2024 and everything else. The point of all of this is 
that in the time of corrupted rulers, there can be moments throughout our history where God can grant some kind of privileges and rights and freedoms. So, yeah, I mean, if Trump wins 2024 and then America has like a golden age, I mean, great that Christians can have a lot of freedom and privilege and even economic prosperity, but remember, to God's eyes, that's still considered as nothing to him. That's still considered as nothing to him. And that's not going to be an era and an age that can last forever. Reagan's era did not last forever. It switches all the time. It switches all the time. People always want temporary vain glory and vain relief, you know. But that's not something permanent. You're not going to permanently change this country, this kingdom. It always belongs to the devil. It's his system. You cannot stop the Antichrist from coming. By the way, even at those uh, temporary moments of freedom, privileges, and relief, you have to realize this. One, with Trump 2024 coming along, one could be is where Christians are able to retain some sort of freedom to keep preaching the gospel, all right? That's one, with the Trump 2024 hype coming along. That could be it. Why? Because we've seen that throughout our history and throughout the scriptures. Two, which is why you shouldn't put such faith in kings. Two, this is something you need to think about, and I am going to give a scriptural example. Two is, it could be a trick where there's a complete turnaround A complete turnaround, and then it turns out it, it bites the Christians even more. Turns around and creates a worse evil. Now, you might say, really, is that the case? Yeah, because uh, here's one thing to think about. There's only one president who accomplished the task where Israel can finally get their peace treaty with the Muslim people, and no, it ain't a Democrat liberal. It was Trump himself. The one who pushed what people are calling the mark of the beast when it's not, the one who pushed it yeah. is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ Trump. That's what people don't think and see. Yeah. See that? So, yes, there are some good things and benefits that benefited the Christian community, but at the same time, it pushed the Antichrist one world government even faster than ever before. Yeah, yeah. Well, give me an example of that one. Caesar. Caesar is the guy who gave freedom to Paul. But you know what happened later on. Later on, he started the first official persecution of Christians. He turned it around. And Paul mentioned that he's the unofficial version of the Antichrist. Look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. See, what you see as freedom for now and protection for now could, turtle, could totally turn around. You might say, why is that? Because that's just obvious in politics. You ever voted for someone in and you expected him to complete these things that you voted for? When did any president in the world fully satisfy the expectations of the people? Come on, man. None. Why? It, there's always some kind of greater political issue, something that they backed off in their promise or in their statement, or something that fell through. No, they don't keep all their promises. Look at the book of 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now look what Paul said. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. This is the Antichrist. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Right? That's the Antichrist. But look at verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. So notice that the Antichrist is being withheld. So he's not fully revealed yet. Then who is is running the scenes. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth what? Already work. Wait, what a, wait a moment. Wait a moment. Verse 6, the Bible says the Antichrist is not revealed yet, but verse 7, 
the mystery of iniquity is already working. What's going on? The officially, his officially revealing, verse 6, is not out yet, but verse 7, unofficially, it's working behind the scenes. Who is the government and the ruler at this time when Paul was writing? The Roman government. Nero's in charge. And Paul considered that the mystery of iniquity already now working. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? He considered that to be the Antichrist. That could be the same thing with Trump, too. That could be the same thing with Trump. Jared Kushner, it's interesting. Uh, if the Antichrist has to have Jewish blood, you already have Kushner, who's Jewish blood. You have that infamous building that he bought that's located on literally 666 <laughs> Avenue, etc. You got that peace treaty set up. And that family is the one who started this for all of you, which some people mistakenly think is the mark of the beast. How about that? Isn't that something? But let's look at the, the future right here. Think about this. If God always sent some kind of ruler or somebody to save or help out his people, even corrupted leaders, from here to here to here to here to here, why not the tribulation as well? As a matter of fact, yes. Look at Revelation 12. Revelation 12. There is somebody who's coming during the tribulation time period who is going to be a hero figure. Hero figure. Look at Revelation chapter 12. And verse 4. Revelation chapter 12. Well, we'll start off at verse 1 so we can lay out the context. All right, here's a deep doctrine right here. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So, this, who is this woman? If you look at the book of Genesis, where Joseph interpreted uh, the dream, he mentioned, uh, he mentioned that the sun, moon, and the stars are actually the 12 tribes of Israel. That's Jacob's family. That's all of Israel. So that's who the woman is, if you compare that dream in Genesis. So this is Israel. But notice that Israel, at verse 5, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. But she gave birth to a child. Who is this child? This child rules with a rod of iron. This child, a lot of people see it to be as Jesus. So I'm going to write several points right here. One is Jesus. So this already happened in the past. Jesus was born from the nation of Israel. And then he lived his life in victory and then went back up to heaven. But because this is Revelation chapter 12, the book of Revelation itself, and God already told John, I'm going to show you things that shall be hereafter, then that means everything he's talking about is about pro prophecy, prophetic, the future, not in the past. So if that's the case, it's very possible that at verse 5, this is yet to happen. It's in the future. Because God told John, I'm going to show you now things which shall be hereafter. Starting at Revelation chapter 4, he said that. So that means all in the future. Nothing's going to be in the past. So it's very possible, verse 5, this is a future event. So then if it's not Jesus, then the second possibility is the 144,000. You might say, why? Because notice that it says child from a woman, right? So it seems to show that there is a subset or someone born from the woman. Look at Revelation 2. Revelation 2. The Bible says in the tribulation, in the tribulation, that God says he's going to have them rule with a rod of iron. It's not just Jesus. It's the tribulation saint as well. Look at Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. See, to the end. That's tribulation reference to the end times. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a what? 
rod of iron. How about that? So there are tribulation saints here that match with Revelation 12, 5. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. See that? So that could be referring to tribulation saints. So Revelation chapter 7, you can turn there if you want to, but if you read verses 4 through 8, you get the 144,000 from Israel. Remember Revelation 12, the woman has to, uh, have to give, uh, excuse me, the child has to be from the woman Israel, Revelation 12. Remember that? So the 144,000 Jews at Revelation chapter 7 match up. So it could be the 144,000. They could be the hero here. Or three, it could be David. Look at the book of Ezekiel. It could be David. Look at the book of Ezekiel. Revelation, the time of the tribulation, is going to be action-packed. You get two witnesses, and then you could be, if separate, the 144,000 and the hero and the mighty angel at Revelation chapter 10. I mean, it's going to be wild. God has his men while, the anti while Satan has his men. The dragon, the false prophet, the antichrist, the ten kings. It's going to be totally action-packed drama right there. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 24, 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Why, David already died. So why would God say in Ezekiel that David will be king over them? See, in the future, David's going to rule over them as king. And they all shall have one shepherd. Oh, shepherd, like Cyrus, he was the shepherd and he was the one that helped the children of Israel. How about that? So David is going to be kind of similar to what Cyrus did, perhaps. They all shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So notice that David is going to come for the children of Israel and be their king. So it could be possible that it's David. Now, here's the more wild one. You ready for this one? Okay, this is what I want to close it out with. So we see throughout the Bible this Trump 2024 hype. All that is, is what we've seen through scriptural passages. God has raised up certain rulers to help out and to save and to benefit his people, either or. It could be corrupted rulers, it could be uh, good rulers, but God considers them all as nothing. And it could be a ruler who's done some good but did a turnaround and it turned out to be a worse version, right? Which is what I mentioned before. What I want to close it off is, you know, the Bible never said, the Bible never said that the hero in Revelation chapter 12, that uh, he starts at the tribulation. It shows his act of working as a hero is operating during the tribulation. If the tribulation is only a few years, whether you put it three and a half, seven, or ten, come on, the hero is not just going to be born didn't Revelation 12 said, uh, born? The hero is born. The hero ain't going to be three and a half years old, seven or ten years old. The hero, if he's going to be a grown male, he's got to be born before the tribulation then. What am I pointing out? Trump 2024 hype might be something a little deeper than you think. There might be a hero who could be already born that time. And he might be the one who's trying to help out God's people or starting things up. Maybe he's going to be discontent with the current government system. He sees all the evil, the pendulum swimming, uh, swinging, you know, with the left-wingers, the communism, socialism rising, and then the faults, of the, the faults of even Republicans themselves. And then he himself gets so discontent that he starts to raise up a party. He starts to raise up his own fight, his own army himself. You might say, why is that possible? Because that happened throughout history. 
That happened throughout history. There might be a hero who might do that. And right now, he's not saved. He's not born again. Because if you're a saved, born again Christian, you get raptured up to heaven. He's going to be probably someone who is into maybe conspiracies, into politics, who's really upset with the current government system. And then later on, when the Christian church gets raptured, and then the two witnesses come down, and then he finally gets witness to somebody, gives him the, gives him the salvation, then during the tribulation, he can raise up that group of people and become their hero. That is some thought to think about. That is some thought to think about. I think that would make a lot of sense. If this hero is not David, and uh, it's not Jesus, and if it's not the 144,000, then it could be one hero, whoever he is. So, keep your eyes peeled, I guess. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, and then open our eyes more to the nuggets and the uh, light from your word. It's a blessed, incredible book. It shows us the future. It prophesies uh, long before people can predict things. Uh, your word prophesies and shows us things that are incredibly enlightening. Help us to watch and wait for the blessed rapture, the blessed hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.